to another football to football and uh, this one's pretty simple once again we are going to be doing the Broncos offense against the Carolina Panthers defense and then of course we'll give some kind of overall thoughts about the game and our predictions of course uh, since the game is about uh, two days away from when we're recording this and we'll also talk about some NFL news since Johnny Manziel just cannot stay out of trouble. And we've got a certain Colin Kaepernick that went out of San Francisco after everybody lauded the fact that now he'd be with a quarterback that would play to his strengths. So, and we got a few other uh, news tidbits there. It was signing day. We're not going to talk about that because, really, come on now. Um... Anyway, guys, it's been a couple of days. Uh, anything going on, Gary? Hey, uh, you know, uh, just hanging out uh, around the house, trying to protect it from Johnny Manziel. Um, besides <laughs> that, uh, you know, just kind of doing a normal thing, working and uh, keeping it real. Wow, I'm glad you keep it real, there, Gary. Yeah, me and Dave Chappelle. <laughs> No, I am just like the NFL, just kind of biding my time for Sunday. Yeah, same here. Um, I don't have to work Saturday from the looks of it. I do have to work later today and we'll have to see about Sunday, but I'll be able to watch Super Bowl Live. And we are doing the post show at some point early Monday morning or Sunday night or whenever the hell it is we're doing it. Right? Mm hmm. Yep. Okay. So, yes, uh, we will not be around on Monday night as usual. We'll be around Sunday night, sometime after the Super Bowl, to discuss what happened. And then you won't see us again until that next Thursday or maybe even that next Monday. I don't know yet. Uh, depends on how fast you want to get into talking about the NFL draft. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so let's start, I guess, with the story that's been prevalent all day. My phone has not stopped alerting me about every constant change in the story. Uh, there is, uh, apparently an altercation that happened between Johnny Manziel and his girlfriend. This is not the first time these two have had an issue. Uh, if you remember, they had an issue in... A, when the car, when a, uh, their car was stopped at one point, they were arguing in the car, and apparently uh, there was a report that Manzo had been drinking, but apparently he had not at that point. Uh, who knows what had been going on here? All we know is that apparently uh, she is claiming he hit her multiple times, that he dragged her by her hair to the car, and. Dallas and Fort Worth police have decided to not press charges and uh, close the case uh, as far as criminal charges go. I'm sure the NFL will do their own investigation as they usually seem to do in these sort of things. I mean, when you hear all this stuff, I mean, just like this is just nuts, right? I mean. Yeah, it is. And, you know, being local area you're speaking of um i'm a little bit surprised that they're just pushing this out of the way just saying oh well you know 
don't worry, you know, nothing's going to happen out of this. You know, you guys worked it out. We're not, you know, going to press any charges. She's not pressing charges. I, I don't know. How, the only thing I could think of is this goes back to what I've said lots of times before about Johnny Menzel and his family. Um, there are ties to connections to uh, the world. Oh, let's just, you know, let's just stick this way. Um, you know, uh, the gambling and things like that are not far from these people because they have money, maybe not by the right means. Uh, so they could probably pay off to the right people. They probably have city council um, to pay off. And uh, that's got to be something because how can this guy get away with it? I mean, Texas is really hard. Uh, they're one of the tougher states on laws. And for this just to go away out of nowhere. Uh, we so we don't know if she chose not to press charges either. But yeah, exactly. But, you know, she, you know, May have had the reasons not to. I don't know, uh, but I'll be honest with you. Joseph Randall got arrested uh, not long ago, two three days ago, probably around the same time. So they may be more concerned about Joseph Randall than Johnny Manziel. Well, I don't think he even got arrested in Dallas when the, at the old girlfriend's house, which is like in Kansas or something. Nope, it's in here. It's Irving. Okay, well, and apparently he was uh, he was let go from the team because of. Gambling on sports, apparently, is what uh, the word was. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the word they put out there. That's PR. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what they're going to say. Right. Uh, you know, they don't want to say it's for other things, of course. Yeah. Uh, Randy, I mean, what do you think about this uh, Manziel it, thing? It's such a mess. I mean, especially you hear this story and it's anyone else. It, it's always obviously bad news. But, I mean, you also have to think about it. We have to wait for all the facts to come out. I mean, like you, Sean, my phone blew up. With just just different details coming in left and right and then changing. And then and then it was, you know, they weren't going to tr- file any charges and everything was dropped and everything moved on or whatever. But obviously with the NFL, it's going to take longer. And, man, you know, it's just a lightning rod for this kind of stuff. So this is going to be talked about for weeks after the Super Bowl. Uh but listen, here, here's the thing. Obviously, I'm one of those people that thinks Johnny Mandel has no place in the league, especially right now. With, I mean, he is just not mature enough to be a, a star quarterback or a backup quarterback for that matter. He just can't seem to keep his nose out of trouble, and it just seems to be getting worse and, and escalating to just effects that just make him uncomfortable. But the thing that worries me and why I think that Mandel not only will be in the league next year, but will might even be starting somewhere, is just the fact that I mean, it's, it's, it's the Greg Hardy versus Ray Rice situation. Yeah, I mean, you can look at both of those two situations and look at them as, like, very similar. They're both, I mean, the details of both are very terrible acts. Unfortunately for Ray Rice, his was caught on video, so you've never seen him again. The Greg Hardy stuff, it's just on paper. When you read it, it's terrible. Okay, give him a suspension. Everyone's, everyone's now moved on. This is going to be the same thing with Manziel. Until you see him punching his girlfriend in the face on camera, it's just going to be let go. But the moment, I mean, videos just seem to be so much more um, impactful to the mainstream audience of this kind of stuff. So, uh, I, it's a terrible situation. It's going to be something I'm going to be really annoyed to talk about over the next few weeks as different details come out and the NFL responds and, and all of that. But most, I see a, a couple games suspension from nothing crazy. Is that what you think too, Gary? Or? Yeah, there'll probably be something around there. You know, they'll bargain it down. Uh, to that and you know it, it's a sad situation that this guy continually messes up and somehow some way he's being protected i really think this guy needs to be uh, away from football for a year uh, if not more if he wants to go play in a canadian football league go play in another football league somewhere else that's at his discretion but i, I don't think the money's good for him I definitely don't, and I don't think the attention is good for him either. I think he needs to be humbled, and that's the best way to kind of put him down to where he understands, hey, you know, I, I'm one foot out the door already. So I want both feet out the door. And If he doesn't get this figured out and if the NFL doesn't put him out, um, 
he's going to walk himself out. He's just on that cusp, and no one's going to take him. Yeah, you're right about that. I just, you know, I have to kind of agree with Randy. It just, it's hard for me to feel like, you know, they're just gonna let it go, and it's, you know, they're they're gonna try to make it something, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, they are. Uh, so, I would not be surprised at all here if it continues. And next year, we're talking about Johnny Menzel playing for a team or being a backup for a team or whatever, because you know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it's sad and whatever. He needs to have a year away to think about all this stuff, be be clean the whole time or whatever the equivalent to that is. And, you know, just grow up a bit. That's that's the number one thing. Grow up a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, I'm like Randy. Just I do not want to be talking about this thing. I don't want to be talking about this off off season. I'm really am. They're going to release him in March. Apparently, they have already decided this that they're releasing him in March. And oh my God, I just really hope I don't hear about uh, the the Cowboys trying to sign him. I just, I really don't. I'm scared that that's what we're going to get. I'm scared that we're going to hear about this, and they're going to still talk about Jerry Jones trying to go get him and stuff, and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, you know, they're trying to talk him into it. You know, not, not today, I'm not talking about Jason Garrett. I don't think Jason Garrett wants any part of Johnny Menzel. I'm talking about the family. I'm talking about people who are close to him. Uh, are probably over there because they're local to this area and they probably have connections with them. And so his name is going to be out there, but uh, I just don't know if I'm going to buy it. I, I think we're looking at a different situation. I mean, I, I, I could even see a Buffalo before I could see Dallas. Uh, we'll have to see. You're talking about another quarterback that apparently uh, this the team doesn't want him to get out. But he wants out of San Francisco. Apparently, he does not want to play for Chip Kelly, even though you could argue that perhaps Chip Kelly might have gone there with Colin Kaepernick in mind. I mean, we don't know that. He could have just gone there because San Francisco has a great draft pick, and he might like one of the quarterbacks that are in the draft. Uh, you know, let's let's just talk about this from a situation of when he to leave San Francisco. Before Chip Kelly came, he was the word was he was going to get traded, or even possibly released because they didn't want to, have to pay for a salary, and and all that. I mean, what do you what do you think about this now? Like, I, I don't see what I don't see what Colin Kaepernick is going about. I, it doesn't make any sense for me. I think. Obviously, his time in San Francisco has kind of gone downhill. Um, uh, Jim Harbaugh really was a big fan of him, and then when they get rid of Jim Harbaugh, obviously, like the favor has just just fallen off for Colin. So I, it might even just be more of a front office thing, the Chip Kelly thing. Like, I don't remember; I haven't seen his full like interview about the situation. I mean, so it could be that. But if I'm Colin Kaepernick, I'm excited to play for Chip Kelly because, listen, Chip Kelly, as a general manager, was a little rough in Philadelphia. Uh, He used players as pawns instead of human beings, and obviously that rubbed people the wrong way. But as far as, you know, coaching goes, I thought he was fine, especially with the quarterbacks. Look at some of the numbers that Nick Foles had under under Chip Kelly in Philadelphia, and then he goes to St. Louis, and he's terrible. I mean, Sam Bradford wasn't that great, but was he ever? And he even made Mark Sanchez look okay. So I think you let Chip Kelly coach Colin Kaepernick and open up that style of offense, I think it would work out for him. And then, you know, he gets that big deal he's looking for. Yeah. I mean, 
Colin Kaepernick, uh, to me, may have some other ideas on what his future is going to look like, and maybe he thinks that his best option is to find a way out of San Francisco now and, and get his you know self in a place where he feels more comfortable. But I'm kind of with Robbie on this. I, I think that Chip Kelly is a guy that he should really consider talking to, get in and, and really look and see what he has planned for you and uh, see if it's what you really want. I think it is. I, I think that, you know, if you're calling Kaepernick, you're happy because you're one of Chip Kelly's number one guys. And so, um, I, I don't know. I don't understand this completely. I haven't actually read any of the comments out of uh, Kaepernick's mouth. So, I'll have to uh, read them and really get more defined on that. But right now, I'm just kind of misunderstanding why he wants out. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, you'd think that, you know, knowing the history that kind of what everybody kept talking about during the season, and we talked about it, that what was missing from that Chip Kelly offense was a uh, a running quarterback, and now he kind of would have that with Colin Kaepernick, and if you maybe have a, you know, Chip Kelly kind of help him with the uh, with the throwing mechanics and, and whatever, and he can, use, he can run the ball a bit more because that's something that Kaepernick uh, or Chip Kelly's going to to sort of go for there, and it's just, it's just weird. It it seems a bit weird. I can understand him also maybe looking at his team and saying, okay, well my team's obviously not the best. I mean I don't blame him for saying what he said about wanting to go to the Jets, which was a team that was sort of bandied about when the uh, initial trade rumors were going around that it might be a team they could be looking at. Now, Brandon Marshall has come out and said, no, we don't want him. We're fine with our quarterbacks, even though uh, the ownership has went out and questioned Geno Smith's uh, heart, which uh, that's never a good thing. But what do you think, Randy, about Colin Kaepernick coming to your team as a backup, obviously? That's, that's the thing, too. You might start in San Francisco – there's nothing that that you're gonna have to unseat Fitz, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, and that's gonna be hard to do. No, I don't want it. I don't want it at all. You you sign him as a quote unquote backup. It's just going to be one of those situations where the moment Ryan Fitzpatrick throws an interception, the crowd is the 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 fans are gonna start wanting Kaepernick out there. I I think the Jets right now have a situation that they're not used to, and that's a decent quarterback structure. I'm still, like, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Ryan Fitzpatrick is the answer or that he's going to lead them to the Super Bowl. But right now you have a, a, a semi-veteran quarterback who can get the job done. You have Geno Smith, who, yes, I'm sure his heart's not in it because he never envisioned himself as a backup. He is a backup who has time as a starting quarterback. So say Ryan Fitzpatrick gets injured next year, you can throw him in there. And then you have the Aaron Parrott and Bryce Petty as your number three guy. I, mean, I have no idea if they still think he is improving or whatever through the whole year, but they drafted him last year to possibly be the guy in a few years. So you have the perfect structure. Structure. You have a decent quarterback, you have an okay backup, and then you have the future waiting back in the wings learning. Throwing Colin Kaepernick in there is just doing the old we have Mark Sanchez we got Tim Tebow situation where oh Tim Tebow is a backup but the moment the quarterback goofs up that crowd's going to turn on the quarterback and they want backup yeah uh, very true um, you know this is uh, I mean this is just kind of crazy like Gary I mean what do you think this I mean, I mean, the Jets are a good team to go to. I mean, I, I could see where Randy has his reservations. And, you know, you never want controversy if you've already got a settled situation. 
you want your starting quarterback to feel comfortable to go into the season knowing it's his job and it's not a situation where he's thinking, oh, I, yeah, a couple mistakes, a couple bad games, I'm going to be out. You know, you want this guy to go in confident knowing this is his team. You want the team to rally around that guy. So why add somebody who's just going to add a lot of controversy? Uh, but, I mean, you have to look from Kaepernick's point of view. He's looking at a team that's got some good receivers. He's got, you know, uh, a team that he's going to definitely benefit from. Uh, and, of course, you know, he doesn't have to do this all. His, that defense is going to help him out. So I can understand why he would want to go there and not maybe return to San Francisco where, you know, defense may be questionable and he's not even sure what, what he's going to have in San Francisco. Yeah, I'd, I can understand why you want to go to the Jets. Obviously, a winning team, you always want to go to a winning team. But to me... You know, I just don't see them taking him. Uh, I think they're going to go on the word of a Brandon Marshall, and if he's complaining, he's saying he don't want him, I think there's going to be more guys than just Brandon Marshall saying they don't want him, and they're going to eventually give into that pressure. I just don't see it. I think Kaepernick winds up staying there, and I think this could be one of those things where he's going to not want to be there, and it's quite possible. Listen, it's quite possible that Kaep- – that, uh, Chip Kelly finds someone in the draft, a quarterback that he likes better, and that could be a possibility that of what Kaepernick's worried about as well, that he may not even start. Um, but there's that chance that maybe he doesn't find somebody that's ready right now and he has to go with Kaepernick, and Kaepernick has a great year, and then look at all the crap you were talking and, and look what happened even then. So... Uh, we'll have to see as uh, time goes along with this. Uh, in a more uh, non-football role here, uh, f- concerning executives, uh, Roger Goodell announced say that there will now be a Rooney rule where you have to interview a woman uh, in order to uh, go f- in the interview process for executives, you know, manager positions and all that stuff, non-coaching roles. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Obviously, you know, in a mood to try to be progressive and everything. Um, it's good, obviously, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd like to get to the point where there are no such things as Rooney rules because, you know, everyone's getting a fair shot, but we're not quite there yet as a society. We kind of talked about this, you know, on the last podcast, and, and now this kind of filters over to, to women as well. I mean, obviously, you know, more and more women are be getting into sports or never have been in sports for years and, and know way more than even us and, and are way smarter than us and, and would totally be perfect fits for some roles in front offices or even in coaching staff. So uh, just because they are female, you should not exclude them from giving the, getting the show to show what they know and what they can bring to a team. So I, I like that that Roger Goodell is going out there and go, hey, just at least hear, hear a couple of them out and give them the foot into the door and let them knock your trucks off. Yeah, I think that that's the big key here is letting that door open a little wider, uh, letting more people see what they can bring to the table because I, I think there are a certain amount of owners who are open to it and are willing to kind of see what they can get out of a uh, female executive or anybody else in the organization, but there are some that maybe have their thought processes on a different level and would never even give an interview. Now they'll have to, and hey, you know, maybe this opens up a job for somebody in a city that would have never been there. Uh, and that's great, and, and you know, it's progression, and that's fine with me. Yeah, it is great that there's progression, all the things that you guys said. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it also offers a different point of view uh, that perhaps is not there when you have uh, a bunch of men in the room or, or whatever. You know, they can dare offer a different perspective on whether it's uh, some kind of merchandise you're trying to sell, a marketing thing, uh, you know, just so many different ways that they can market. I mean, look at the NFL is trying to market uh, football as family, and they've been trying to do that for the past couple of years. Um you know, obviously trying to get more women into football. If you have women in these executive position, positions who would have a female point of view already there to, to give you and to bounce off of, that's already a great thing. 
you know. So uh, I don't see what the wrong in this is at all. And if if it gives more women the, these opportunities, then that's that's a great thing. Uh, finally, going back to on the field things, but uh, Demarco Murray is apparently uncomfortable with the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, he has not asked for a release or a trade, but uh, the Philadelphia Eagles are not really wanting to cut him. He doesn't seem like he wants to be there based off of what happened, but isn't that under Chip Kelly's system? He should he should maybe give this this a one-year shot to see what happens with this new coach, right? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that the, you know, for both sides, it would be bad for business um, to, to basically cut him. Uh, they've already given him a you know, guaranteed amount of money that they were wanting to pay him, and it would just hurt the salary cap-wise to cut him early. And I just feel like that, you know, it, it really, we're speculating, really, we're feeling out the thought process of maybe him moving, but I think that's just maybe wishful thinking on some people's part. I think he's in for, for this long haul, and I think so for the Eagles. They, they know it's going to hurt them, and I think he knows if he goes somewhere else, he's not going to get paid the same amount. See, this is just another one of those situations where taking the money really is the bad the bad call. Uh, obviously, he doesn't seem very happy there, but uh, you know, I think most of the saw this coming. I mean, the Dallas Cowboys ran Murray into the ground that last year. I mean, just completely... The entire team on his back ran him more more carries than anyone else in the league by far. So he, he knew he wasn't going to have as much in the tank the next year, and I think the Eagles kind of saw that too and and surrounded him with a bunch of talent and and tried to spread the ball out a little bit more. And then like like Gary said that you know the Chip Kelly situation just didn't work out. I mean the, he doesn't run the same style that Kelly was looking for. I I think we see the same thing in Denver, which we'll talk about pretty soon, where Peyton Manning wants it, you know, out of the shotgun, and and most of his running backs like that that running start. So him in the shotgun messed up the running game. So there's a lot of little things, even though you just think hit ball, run forward, but just a different way philosophy are can mess that up. And I think DeMarco Murray is looking at it going, listen, I was the man in Dallas, and now I'm, I'm one of, like, four guys, and it's not even the style I enjoy. So, uh, uh-oh, I took the money, but now now everyone's making fun of me. So now, now I want to go back to some place that people actually adore me. So I mean, it's a, a, a shitty situation, but I don't know what, really what you can do about it. Yeah, that's the thing what Randy talked about. I mean, certainly the Eagles have the authority – uh, to do what's best for business. See what I did there. Um, so, you know. Like. <laughs> but, uh, See, I, and, I, and I held off earlier about controversy who creates cash because oh. I didn't want to do the deal, and then you go best for business. So now uh, I have yeah. to do it. Oh, man. So, yeah, I wish I had the Eric Bischoff uh, saw on the play right here, but I don't. Um, so, uh, and I, uh, we, were, we talked about that for a little bit on the, the show previously, but. Um, I love how I just now I get random messages from people um, asking me wrestling questions at uh, at six in the morning. Uh, but uh, anyway, Des uh, Des Bryant is on record asking Demarco Murray to come home. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem per se. I I just have this like thing of he left. Don't bring him back. He decided to leave. Good riddance. You know, uh, you got McFadden. Uh, you know, all biases aside, he did just fine. That you have no guarantee that Murray's gonna come back and be the same guy. And like, I just don't see how they both can coexist. I mean, obviously McFadden didn't do well when he was being the backup. You know. This is a situation that I look at, and I try to think to myself, okay, uh, when DeMarco Murray was playing in Dallas, I mean, it seemed like they had the perfect chemistry going. Uh, the offensive line seemed to play better because of Murray. Murray didn't play better because of that offensive line. Uh, the next year, not there. Um, they've got various running backs behind them, that offensive line does, and, and they just don't play well. Uh, they don't seem to have that same well-oiled, greased-up, running game that they did the year before. 
Uh, so that's the problem. And is it going to come back just because Murray shows back in Metallus? I don't know that. And that's not a guarantee. And not only that, Randy just pointed it out. Dallas ran this guy into the ground. And this guy hasn't gotten younger just because he went to the Eagles. There was no fun of youth there. He said, no, you're older. So I think that maybe, Sean, you're on to something here. I mean, as nice as it is to dream that this guy comes back and is that same running back we saw in 2014, uh, I, I would rather go get a rookie, go get somebody else who could do it, or just stay with McFadden. McFadden didn't do terrible. What do you think about the uh, Murray going back to Dallas scenario that Bryant won? I, I don't see it. I, I'm with you, John. Whereas, like, listen, he left. Uh, so just trying to move on from all parties. Uh, it's, I mean, DeMarco Murray had a, a great year or two, but it, I don't think you're going to look at him and go, he's one of the, the greatest Dallas Cowboys running backs of all time. I wouldn't put him anywhere in those kind of classes. So it's just one of those things. I wouldn't even worry about it. I, I wouldn't put all my eggs in the Darren McFadden basket by all means, but I wouldn't go back to DeMarco Murray. No, obviously you need to have guys uh, behind McFadden that you trust, that if McFadden goes down, who, I mean, this was his healthiest yeah. year he's ever had. Yeah, I would rather they win when yeah. Darren McFadden goes down. No, and obviously, I mean, you know, with the way running backs, I mean, you got – Todd Gurley, who was obviously a hit, and he was awesome, and his jury's still out on Melvin Gordon. But uh, you know, you it's been you've been able to find running backs in later rounds. It's certainly something you can look into uh, to have a, a younger guy that you can count on there. But uh, speaking of things we can count on, you can count on us uh, for your Super Bowl uh, preview that we're about to do uh, right now. Uh, you know, we did part one on uh, on Monday, and uh, we're going to do our part two here now. So let's look at the Broncos offense against the Carolina Panthers defense. Uh, very similar situation to the Broncos defense where Carolina comes in with a uh, really great defense. I mean, they, they have a uh, defensive line, you know, Charles Johnson – kind of refreshed with not having played the whole year. Um, Jared Allen's kind of been banged up, but you still got him there off the trade. And then where they're really good is at the linebackers with Luke Keekley, of course, being your your brain there in the middle. And then Josh Morgan, of course, who's been terrific in the secondary, kind of leading that, that around. Uh, but they are missing some guys, missing veteran presence, you know, of Charles Tillman and not having been able to wickery. And on the other side, you got Peyton Manning, who, you know, uh, he still is kind of just managing the game along. He's not the old Peyton Manning. He's still very smart uh, before the snap and able to read the defense and everything. What do you, if you're the Broncos offense, how are you attacking this Carolina Panthers defense? Gary? One of you guys. <laughs> no, no. I'm sorry. My mute button was on. I've been coughing, and I did not want the people to have to hear me hack on the computer. You know? uh, but anyway, uh, my, my thought process on this is, you know, you've got to make sure you keep – excuse me. Yeah, I'm just tired. Uh, Peyton, oh. hey, you got to keep him upright. you got to give him the opportunity to throw the ball. And to do that, you've got to have a mixture of running and passing plays. For that to be effective, you've got to be effective in the running game. So they've got to find a way to make some holes happen and make sure that they can keep some uh, good, you know, three, four-yard runs going. They can't allow the Carolina Panthers to stuff them at the line, even behind the line, because trust me, the Panthers are great at it. They know how to do it. So I'm looking for uh, Peyton to have to really make sure that he gets the ball out quickly and to use a lot of play action. Uh, I think that's going to help them. That's going to give him an opportunity. Even if he's in the shotgun, he's got to fake it and, and get you know, the illusion that the running back's going to take it. 
Um, I think that's a good way to kind of keep these guys from rushing too much at times. Uh, and it's also going to keep some of these other guys like Luke Keekley honest and make sure that they don't try to get in the backfield as much as they want to. So. I, I think Gary is pretty close to what my idea is for what Denver needs to do in this game. And, and really, I think all of us believe that the only way Denver can win this game is if the running game gets going and, and you know, they can run it all over Carolina, which is way easier said than done. I mean, Carolina's defense is stout. Uh, but I really think if you're Denver, you go out there on your first drive or two and do a couple of play action passes. You do a couple of screen plays. You take uh, the aggressive nature of Carolina and use it against them. I, I think that's something that Seattle and Arizona did not do in the playoffs. You know, they allowed Carolina to run in and disrupt the passing game instead of going, oh no, they're bringing nine guys. Oh, well, look, I dumped it over their heads and then we're going to make a big play. I think. You know, you, you cannot play towards Carolina's strength. You take Carolina's strength and use it against them. And Peyton Manning is one of those guys that really can do something like that. And then once you do that and you, you get them back on their heels a little bit, your main goal then is to keep Cam Newton off the field. Because you, I mean, we talked about it again on Monday where Cam Newton and that offense work so well when they're going downhill. When they have momentum, you know, when they start doing the first down dances and having a good time, you know, you're over. Once Cam Newton starts smiling and laughing, it's over. So you want him uncomfortable on the sideline watching you just meticulously go down the field, whether it's three points or seven points. You you want to drive to go at least five minutes. You want to disrupt the rhythm of the Carolina offense. I think if you're Denver, that's what you have to do. Uh, you guys both bring up good points, but I think one of the very important things that you have to make sure of is Peyton Manning is going to have to kind of play the way he's played the last uh, in the two games is you have to play mistake-free football. Uh, the number one thing that the Carolina Panthers defense does is they thrive off turnovers. And once they get one, they are like, you know, sharks that smell uh, things they just come in waves and get more and you cannot uh, give up a pick six you, you cannot be fumbling the ball uh, you know the uh, Gary brought up the whole keeping him upright the offensive line is, is really gonna have to dig in they're gonna have to have schemes they might have to have a uh, running back back there with Peyton even on uh passing downs and, and everything like that to make sure that he's picking up a block because you don't want Peyton getting sacked and maybe fumbling or getting hit in the arm or uh, anything like that because you don't want to give that Carolina defense an opportunity to make a play and then put that Carolina offense uh, back on the field as well if they don't score. Um, you know, and and that's and, and another thing that the uh, – Peyton Manning has had issues with is his receivers dropping balls. Um, and with this Carolina secondary, you know, Josh Norman can't uh, defend everyone, obviously. Uh, he tries to stay on one side of the field. He's not a guy that shadows. He's not a guy that goes in the slot. Um, what do you think about how can they use the receivers uh, against – Josh Norman, and against, uh, you know, you got Luke Keekley that's going to be going around, over the middle, and, and of course, uh, Kirk Coleman and all that at safety. How, how can they best use them that way? I think the best way to use a receiver is all timing routes. I think, I mean, that's what Peyton Manning does best, is he sacks the defense and knows where to go. But this whole two weeks, hopefully, they have come up with a lot of crossing routes, a lot of just like timing situation where you know, okay, at this point he should at least have a step and I can go here. Uh, not going to beat Carolina deep with Peyton Manning's arm, which is, again, what I said a couple weeks ago where I thought Arizona, Arizona had a shot to beat it because you could beat Carolina deep. Peyton Manning can't do that. So it's all going to be about the short passes and, and just the quick get-offs and the receivers, of, of course, have to catch the ball, which is something they haven't been able to do lately. 
Yeah, and, and then, you know, it's a great point because I was, you know, talking about this the other day. I mean, this team has been so up and down when it comes to the receivers. I think they're going to either have a great game receiving the ball or they're going to drop them, every, you know, all in one game. And they can't afford for this game to be the drop game. Uh, but the other thing is, is, you know, another thought process on Peyton getting the ball out is, you know, maybe giving some quick slants, uh, some, definitely some things to the outside towards the sidelines. And, and I don't uh, think that you can be afraid to give a few screen passes. I think some screens could work here. Um, you know, I, I know Carolina's defense is very fast, but if you can find a way to do it, if you work on it in practice, uh, it may be a good way to give your receiver a chance to maybe escape some pressure quickly and maybe get a home run. So, uh, because if you can get away from the first wave, you you might get a chance to get out there and maybe go 60. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, this is the thing. And Randy's already pointed it out. I think a lot of people understand this. This Panthers team is built on hype. Uh, they really want to get going. They want to be the ones on top, of it, and they want to be uh, with all the momentum. And the one way you can really hurt them is to do clock management, to really grind the clock down, to get to the second quarter, to be 3-3, three to three, things like that, really get this team to start thinking. Uh, if they start thinking too much, that's when they may start making mistakes. If you know they're doing well, they're not going to think, and you're the one thinking too much. So. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you have a uh, – this receiving core that certainly you have speed. You have speed in Demarius Thomas. You have speed in Emmanuel Sanders. Those guys can get deep. We've seen Sanders do it. And we've seen Peyton Manning. He can get it there a couple of times, maybe three or four times a game. But you've, you've got to know – and Peyton Manning's smart. you just got to know when to take that shot – but most of all, the ball has to be there, and uh, you have to make sure you catch it when that opportunity is there because if you don't, as Randy said, exploit those uh, opportunities, they're going to just slam you down on the, the crossing route. They're going to slam you down on the slant route, and then it's going to be very difficult for Peyton Manning uh, to get that ball out, and eventually you know, the lanes are going to get clogged, and you're, you're not going to have anybody to – the throw too, and I and I look at a guy like Vernon Davis, who has been just absent in these last two games here in the playoffs. He's got to step up and be that second tight end that you 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 brought him over for. Uh, you know what Owen Dams can give you, whatever. But Vernon Davis is a guy that can change the game when he's on. Uh, he's still a very good caliber tight end, and you want to give. Uh, Peyton Manning as many outlets as you possibly can uh, against that defense. If you're limiting him to, you know, n- not that, you know, Benny Fowler and Caldwell and all of them have been capable with Peyton Manning, obviously, but if, if you got uh, Daniels and Davis with your t- two tight end sets coming out there where you can make them think it's a run, you go on play action and Vernon Davis can, can run a, a little post to the outside or or just, you know, gets you across around, it it will help so much. Yeah. I um, mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, you know, we've kind of hit a few of the points, and I just want to say this, and you know, we're talking about the Broncos offense, uh, this Panthers defense is uh, a defense that swarms. I mean, they do a lot of things right. Why they're where they're at. That's why they have the record they do. Uh, so I mean, you just got to be aware uh, of where those guys are at, and um, they're definitely aware of where we're at. They know exactly how to get to the ball. They know uh, how to exploit things, and so I mean, I think it's gonna be very interesting. I, I think that this Panthers defense is definitely gonna give uh, Peyton Manning a run for his money. Yeah, I mean, they they they're gonna clog them. They're one of the great defenses at stopping the run, which is the problem. Uh, for the Broncos, because as you guys noted, if that running game doesn't work, it's going to be a long day for Peyton Manning. Uh, in fact, when the Broncos have 30 or more carries, they are undefeated. But when you know they have less than that, they, they run in, into some issues. And that offensive line, the way it is, where it's been a little suspect at times, 
Um, and you've got a guy like a Luke Keekley there who's just reading everything as it comes along. I can just already see things not going that well for Peyton Manning. But, I mean, what, what do you think is that biggest strength for Carolina's defense when, when you look at it? Oh, it's definitely the pressure. I mean, yes, they can stop the, the run, but I really think it's just how they can disrupt the passing game. They shot a lot against Arizona in that first half where they just destroyed Carson Palmer. They made him throw some just terrible-looking passes because he was completely off balance. But I think you have to take that strength and kind of bring him back a little bit against Denver. It sounds so weird to, to, to say, but I honestly think that if you're Carolina, you're coming into this going, make Peyton Manning show that he can beat us. Because you, as all three of us have said, Denver's going to have to run the ball to win this game. So I'm, I'm keying in on the run. I'm not blitzing that much unless it's key situations early. And and sitting back on the run and, and you know playing receivers and going okay Peyton, you know let's see you make the perfect throws and your receivers catch the ball and and kind of dial back the, the pressure and and be more smart about it like bring it here and there you know just not every play uh, controlled pressure I think is the best way to put it I think is what Carolina needs to do in this game. Kerry, uh, when you're looking at, I, I mentioned that Carolina throws off turnovers. Uh, they do uh, get sacks. I mean, how many do you see Peyton Manning kind of being a bit turnover prone here? Do you see uh, Carolina getting a few turnovers in this one? I do. I, and, you know, you look at it and you say, well, you know, if the Broncos play the perfect game, you know, well, what are you going to get? And I still think, even if, even if they play at the highest level that they can play, I still see, you know, two or three sacks, even if they're playing really well. Uh, and I definitely see a turnover somewhere. I mean, the Panthers are uh, just on it this year, and they make turnovers happen even when they're not really given to them. So, I mean, I could definitely see a pick or even, you know, maybe even a, a fumble return for a touchdown. Uh, something like that I could definitely see happening. Um, but, I mean, it, it's just going to be odd if we don't see something to that nature. Yeah, I mean, uh, what do you what do you think, Randy? You, you see that happening? Oh, yeah, I, at least one turnover, if not more. I just, it's... It, I, I've been sitting here for the last two weeks trying to come up with different ways for me to go. Denver can win this game. I, I'm running out of ideas. Yeah, I'm at the same way here. I mean, that's why you're seeing, I think, a large number of people just say Panthers are winning this game. It's just it's so hard uh, to think that Peyton Manning is just going to all of a sudden channel that great Peyton Manning from that time. And then the defense is going to be on call. And look, listen, again, as we noted last week, this is going to be a much different defense than Cam Newton's play, but it's not like Cam Newton doesn't play against a great defense all the time in practice. So, I mean, he's got that. There's things to Denver's defense that they're going to not have faced before that are going to be different, and it's all going to come down to both sides of the ball and special teams are all going to have to be just on it all day, and that's so hard uh, to say that that's going to happen. I mean, like, everybody, the, all the guys that you're going to rely on are all going to have to be key, and I still think even as e- even if, unless the defense just makes all these kinds of, you know, pick sixes or fumble recovery for a touchdown or something like that, it doesn't matter what happens, how many, how many turnovers you make Cam Newton commit, or if you make Jonathan Stewart fumble or or whatever, if that run game for the Broncos isn't going, it don't matter because you're going to stop Peyton, you're going to stop Peyton Manning if you don't because that's that's what he relies on is the play action. So, yeah. Any any final thoughts, guys, before we get into a prediction or anything like that? I think I said my piece. Yeah, 
Uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, you brought up how Carolina hasn't really seen a defense like like Denver, and, and really the closest thing that they have seen is Seattle's. And uh, yes, I mean, you go out and blow them out in the first half, and it, but you go back and look at the stats, the stats weren't really that great. That's exactly what they have to do against Denver. If, if the Carolina defense is able to win the field position and allow Cam Newton to have a short field against Denver, he can still tear them up. Uh, so, it, again, it's just one of those things where I'm just trying to come up with ways. Because you, how many times have we seen this? Where, oh yeah, this team is so much better than the other team. Everyone, it's it, it's a lock, and then the other team wins. So it's like I'm right. looking at it, going, "What am I missing? Mm-hmm. There has to be something that I'm missing. I, I just am running out of ideas." Yeah, I'm same way here, but uh. All right, so let's get into the predictions for this thing here. I had a 24-21 Panthers. Um, I had them initially losing to the Cardinals. The Panthers are the ones that made it here. I don't see a reason why the Panthers don't win this thing. I think it'll be close, but ultimately Peyton falls a bit short. Uh, you know, I'm looking at this game as a 27 to 10 uh, Panthers victory. Uh, I think when you're looking at this game, I think that really the Broncos are going to try to fight hard to get yards. They'll get yards, but they won't be able to punch it in at times because I think Carolina is just going to stiffen up too much on their defensive side. Um, I think the Broncos will do the same at some points, but I just don't think they can hold off. I think that the Panthers are going to start wearing them down with Jonathan Stewart and Tolbert. And, uh, of course, I think Cam Newton is going to wear them out a little bit himself with his legs. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that even uh, I still would put, you know, uh, you know what? It's kind of funny to say the guy you never think is going to win the MVP or the guy you think is going to win the MVP usually doesn't win it. So I'm going to say Jonathan Stewart wins the Super Bowl MVP this year. Uh, it's like again, just I'm sitting here still. Like I really think Denver scores first to have a chance. Uh, we talked about it all week. How Carolina loves to play down downhill, and you know a huge stage like the Super Bowl, especially Super Bowl Fifty. It's most of their first time there. If you can get them in a hole, maybe everything tightens up and they start struggling and they start pressing and and all that something just tells me that carolina's talent is just just too good cam newton absolutely loves the big stage and you're not going to get any bigger stage than this uh i really think that they're i mean from everything you've seen this week they seem loose i mean it's going to be a whole different story come sunday and they get on that field and oh my god it's now time but everything I've seen shows that they're very loose still, having a good time. I think they go out on that field and they want to prove all of the doubters wrong. They want to, to look at all of the old men that don't like the way that they play or how cocky they are at times and shove it right down their throat. So as much as I want to say it's going to be a close game, I can't. Um, I have Carolina winning this 45-3. to I, mean, it's, I think it's going to be... Brutal by halftime. Jeez. It's like we're going to see Brock Osweiler in this Super Bowl. It's, it's highly possible. I just, just everything I look at, it's Denver would have to play a perfect game, like the, slowing the, the pace down, you know, completely getting Carolina off rhythm. And even then, I still think Carolina would probably win the game. So I, I think Carolina scores early, and then it's just. It snowballs from there. Wow. All right. Well, I think that does it. We've we done our predictions. We kind of broke things down, I mean, between the two shows. So, uh, you know, if you missed part one, we broke down the Carolina offense against the Denver defense. Uh, go check that out. There's time stamps to tell you when exactly in the podcast we start that. We also had a pretty uh, interesting conversation about the uh, what Cam Newton has now been asked a zillion times, and he's so tired of hearing uh, about his comments that were a little bit controversial. Um, but, uh, you know, just we'll have to see how the game goes on Sunday about those uh, 
Super Bowl commercials that they're better than they have been the last couple of years, especially last year's wasn't that great. Um, so let's uh, see what happens. Uh, everybody's excited, and uh, the ratings, see if they can break break those from, from last year. But All right, well, if uh, you enjoyed what you heard here, you can subscribe on iTunes, t- Stitcher, TuneIn, wherever there are podcasts. Write a review. Uh, that helps us out a lot as well. Helps us uh, gain popularity in those rankings so that more people can listen to us, you know. And, of course, we are part of the W2M Network. Uh, we are also part of Last Word on Sports, uh, dot com as well. Thank you to them uh, for um, letting us uh, uh, be in partnership with them on their website. Go check out what uh, – they have wonderful – uh, writers there that write all kinds of articles about all kinds of sports, uh, anything you want, uh, it's there for you. Um, and of course, on the W2 Network, we have not only this just podcast, uh, we have uh, you know our wrestling podcast that we just got done doing, uh, talking about uh, uh, the whole big deal with intergender wrestling and Lucha Underground, uh, Bret Hart having cancel, cancer, um, and his battle through that and of course all the show reviews that we do uh shinsuke nakamura coming to wwe finally and all of that of course and uh the uh the course randy's podcast the backlog busting uh project uh you always had a new uh episode tell everybody about it yeah, our, our latest episode, Wes and I have a, a pretty lengthy conversation about uh, Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time, what was good, what was bad, what is not aged very well. Um, I talk about a wonderful indie platformer that, that showed love to the old Sega Genesis games of old, and a game called Freedom Planet, and uh, Wes dives into the weird, weird world that was Catherine back on the PS3. Yeah, and of course, uh, you can check out all the other podcasts that are there on YouTube as well or anywhere else. Um, should have the Corbin Multiplayer podcast out sometime tomorrow. But all right. Well, uh, until Sunday night when we're talking about what happened in the Super Bowl, uh, enjoy the festivities, enjoy the game, and we'll see everybody later. <laughs>